everyone. I'm Hema Socorro, and I'm going to talk about an story about an app with lots of flow, and we will see why I have put flow that way. So first, uh, before starting, I'm going to talk uh, about three things about me, so you can know me better. I'm an Android engineer. I have been breaking apps since 2009, also fixing them, but mostly breaking. Uh, I have also done some iOS um, and backend, but what I like more is to do Android development. Uh, I'm Spanish. I live in the Canary Island, uh, which are, are part of, of Spain. And I have to confess that I am also hobby addicted. Yes, I have a lot of hobby and a little time to dedicate to, to them. I love reading, sewing my own clothes, a drawing and also music. And music has been always, uh, has played always a big part in my life, but it wasn't until two years ago when I went to enroll my daughter in the music school that I ended enroll myself. <laughs> so uh, I started learning to play the cello, which is my favorite instrument. Uh, it has always been. And also I had to learn the basics of uh, music uh, theory. And as part of the first things that you have to learn is uh, to identify so what is an interval. Okay, so an interval is the gap that we can find between two notes. For example, if we have here the, the classical uh, C scale, C major scale, we could uh, say that uh, there is a third between these two notes. Um, as a musician, you have to uh, learn to remember the difference between these songs and to identify that this is a third and not a second or another thing. And there is a trick you could use for that, especially if you have very bad memory, as I have. And this trick is to use a musical reference to learn that. A musical reference is a popular song that you will find easy to remember and the, that you can uh, relate with those intervals. So in the case of a third major, as uh, we have here, I will try to remember how to sing the first notes of uh, Wish You a Merry Christmas. That will be something like da da. <laughs> I'm sorry if it doesn't sound right, but it, it will be something like that. So, so now I had uh, a very bad memory of I was saying, and also had to memorize all those intervals and all those uh, musical references. Um, so yeah, I had a problem. And what does an Android developer when he or she has a problem? Well, we decide to do an app to solve it. So I decided to do an app. Uh, I decided to create an app to help me to learn those intervals. This app uh, was a quiz app. so. Uh, you will have some questions uh, in which uh, in every question you you will have a, a sound and then you will have to uh, identify the interval of the sound between some options. And at the end of the quiz, you will have a, a result screen when you can see which ones of the questions you have failed. And in, th in those cases, you will have uh, the link to the musical reference. So it will be easier for you to uh, review and recheck all those musical references. And that uh, will help you to remember the, uh, this relation relationship between the interval and the reference. Also, I decided to use Flow with it to do it because I'm a heavy user of RS Java. And I wanted to test it and to, to use it intensively. So I decided to use Flow and to use ShareFlow and StateFlow especially. And I decided to use MBI. Uh, maybe this application, maybe not. Uh, this application will be perfectly done with uh, another architecture, but I wanted to use MBI because it's the perfect example of a reactive uh, implementation of an architecture. So those were the decisions I took before starting to do this app. And now we are going to, to compose this symphony. 
well, using those cores. We are going to use MBI, unidirectional data flow, which is a concept uh, strictly re relationed uh, with MBI. We are going to use flow and a state flow. And we are going to start with the first one. So uh, to explain what MBI is and its origins, I always like to refer to Andres told um, idea of uh, comparing it to a something as natural as a, a communication interchange. So we have a person, a, a user that is communicating with a computer, in our case with a phone, in, in the case of uh, you know, Android developers. And um, this is pretty natural. The user does uh, things in the, in the UI uh, and the computer reacts somehow and changes the interface based on those interactions. For example, if you refresh a list, uh, the computer will add more rows to the list. So this is done via an interface. In our case, we use uh, the, the tab or the UI events that we generate. And in the case of the computer or the phone, it will use the screen to refer those uh, changes. So we can say that we are uh, created some inputs that are processed, and then we are getting some kind of an output. And this looks pretty similar to something that we already know and use every day in our life, which is a function. So we are doing something, we have a variable that we are changing, then something happens, and then we have a new, a new state, a new result. So this is the, the premise that Andres Todd used to design his framework, which is CycleJS, and was the framework that later inspired, inspired uh, Heinz Dorfman to create the first MBI Android architecture, or the, the known as the first one. Maybe there was some attempts before, but this is the, the most popular one. So what we have here, we have intents, which are not Android intents, this is what I don't really <laughs> like a lot to use intent for this because it's in the Android world could be very confusing. But okay, we, we can understand intent as an action uh, from the user intentions. So the user does some inten intentions, some actions that will modify the model, the internal model of the view. And then we will have a new model to display that. Uh, Will, uh, will be displayed. And then this new state uh, could receive new UI events that will, again, uh, will be converted into actions and will modify the model, etc. But in Android, um, the most implementations look really like something like this. Now we have this intent and the model and then the view, and we convert it to something like this. So the user will touch the screen, or will do whatever he or she wants. This will translate into an intent, which I don't really like, as I said. So I like to call UI event as, you know, everything the user can do with the UI. Uh, then this will go to an interpreter, which will be in, in, in charge of converting it to an axiom. We will see now what this means. Then everything will go to a processor, which will be the responsible to whatever changes we need to do in the uh, internal model of the information. Then we will get a result and it will go to our reducer, who will be the responsible to change the view state. And we will see in, in the screen that something has changed as response as our change. So let's go with the first part and see it in detail. So for example, in my case, or in the, the case I, I was doing, which was the quiz app, um, here I, I um, created a, a new event for everything that could be done from the, from the UI. And this is what you have to do if you want to apply MBI to your application. You have to think about those events that uh, can be triggered from, from the UI and created them here. So in my case, for example, I created one for the start quiz, the one that will be launched uh, once the activity or fragment is shown. 
And then uh, select answer for every time the user selects an answer, see results when the user wants to see the, the results, navigate to sample to navigate to the uh, musical reference and, and listen to it, and finish for well, when the user clicks the finish button. And those UI events are going to be converted into action. Action is really a, a representation of the domain of the, the domain part of the domain uh, responsibility of everything that can be done from the UI. So, for example, in my case, uh, when the list is going, the list no, the the first question is going to be loaded. I needed an action that will be get first question, then select answer. Uh, for when the user selects an answer, see results, navigate to example, and finish. Okay, so it looks pretty similar. The uh, you know the UI events that I des I am have designed and the actions related to them. So the interpreter will be just mapping you know the start quiz with the get first question, select answer with the action select as answer. In my case, maybe makes makes sense that. Uh, we uh, skip this part because UI events are pretty similar with their action counterparts. So in my case, I decided to remove it. But in other cases where you can match or map uh, to one or two more UI events to the same action, it makes sense to have this interpreter and to map several UI events to the same action. In this case, for example, if you have a list and it's the first time you are going to load a list and you have a load page actions, it makes sense that you reuse the, the load page that you are going to use for loading every one of the pages in the, in the list. So it depends on your case. In my case, uh, in, in order to simplify it, I decided to remove it, but uh, you know, you, you can always adapt it to your application. And then once we have the action, we are going to the processor. The processor is, is where the magic happens. If it is where you are going to your database or you are going to the network and get uh, some information, you are going to modify the information, whatever you need to do. So it say that this, this is the only part where side effects should take part uh, during the whole MBI flow. In my case, if I'm going, if I'm receiving the start quiz uh, UI event, I'm going to call get first question, which will be a, a method that will get the first question from the uh, database or from a US case, whatever. So here you will map the, the action to the, um, uh, to the method or the logic that you are going to use to uh, do that action. And then this logic, this method will return a result. You always, uh, uh, you, you have ooh, a lot of options here. You can connect this processor to the domain if you find it necessary. You can connect it to the repository. Uh, I don't like to be very strict because you know, maybe your app doesn't need that domain. Uh, you can connect it directly to the repository because uh, if you will implement the domain will be a, an emic one and just have the same as the repository, it depends. Okay, so whatever fits your needs, uh, you can do here. Also, I have seen processors where the logic is implemented inside the, the processor. Uh, well, in cases uh, where you don't need a lot of logic. So whatever fits your need or your team needs, you can do. Yeah, and it will be fine as soon as, as, soon as everyone is, is okay with it. And then uh, once we have the result, we are going to this part and then I'm going to implement the reducer and get the view state. We are going to see. So in the case of the result, for my case, I will have two results, which will be next question update. It will be an update that will uh, could have three different states. Could have a loading state, which I will consent as a first emitted uh, element 
uh, to reflect in the UI that we are not adding the, the question. And also I, I have a failure and a Sussex states. Uh, in the failure, well, I, ha I will have all the information I need to uh, show the error in the screen. And in the Sussex, I will have the next question that will be the next change I need in the, in the screen. And then we have a view state that will be a representation of what we have in the screen. In this case, or in, we have, we used to have two, two options. We have, we can uh, model this view state using a, a class, in my case, a data class, where uh, I have all the UI uh, needs or UI inf all the information the UI needs. For example, uh, I, if the UI have some kind of loading, I have there a Boolean representing the state of the loading, uh, the question, the result. If there has been an error, I have there the, the error. Um, and there is another option, which is to model the state using a seal class and you will have a state for loading, a state for error, a different state for showed results and a different state for show question. Uh, which one should I use? Well, it depends. Uh, for example, if you can have more than one view state at the same time, you can have you can have an error at the same time you are showing a question then you have to use a data class because otherwise once you have changed to for example the error here you are going to lost uh, to lose the question and if the view state uh, must be mutually exclusive you can use a seed class so it depends on your case. If you are just going to show one of those states and you don't need to maintain the last state, for example, you were showing a question and now you are showing an error and you don't need to know about the questions, I will go for, for the seal class because it means that you are, uh, your view state is mutually exclusive. And in the other case, I will go for the data class. In my case, as I wanted to show errors and whatever with um, with the question in a screen, uh, I used the, the data class option. And then we have the reducer, whose responsibility is to convert those results in a new state using the last view state. So as we can see here, for example, if we are receiving a loading result from the next question update, uh, I will set the is loading to true and the error is null. We have to be careful always with this because if we had an error from the last state and now we don't have it, uh, we have to set it to null. Then uh, if there is any kind of failure, I will get a next question update. So I'm going to change the error to the error I'm going to show in the screen. And if my result is a Sussex, I'm going to uh, set this loading to false because I have a question. I'm going to set the error to null and I'm going to uh, return the question to the UI. As always, this is, uh, you can uh, complicate this as much as you want. Complicate in the sense that if you don't want to use, for example, the same model of question that you are using in the, um, in the result, you can change it to a uh, UI question model, it depends on the on your application. Okay, if you see that your reducer grows a lot, you can also um, divide, uh, split your reducer in tiny reducers. And you can do that, for example, processing, uh, having a reducer to every kind of result you have. So here, oh, I could have a reducer for the next question updates. So you will process only the next question update types. And then another reducer for the quiz finish update. And it will only process the quiz finish updates. All of them will use the last view state. Um, everything will be fine that way. Okay, so here's our, our travel or trip uh, using the MBI. And now we are going to unidirectional data flow and why it is important in the case of MBI. So we have here 
our MBI flow, our model of an MBI flow. And as we can see, we need that all the events uh, needs to be generated from one place, which is here from the user, and all the view states, all the uh, new states of the view need to arrive to certain point. And I like always to think about this as a pipe. So we need events that are going to enter in our flow using always the same, the same point. And also we are going to get the states that are going to uh, be uh, collected from the same point. So which is unidirectional that the flow means um, you have to follow this, uh, this uh, pipe and you cannot introduce or shouldn't introduce events and, re uh, and recover events from different points. But how can we make this work? How can we assure that we are going to, <coughs> sorry, to generate those events or to put those events into, into the flow from just one point and to recover those events from another point? So this is where flow comes in handy. Flow is a cold stream, it's a pipe. I, I always like to, to use the idea of a pipe. So it's a pipe where you are going to send um, objects, emissions, whatever you, you want to call it. Uh, it, is, uh, it has a structured concurrency. Uh, it uh, has an efficient data transformation and it's really easy to test because you just have to put something to collect everything that is emitted and see if you are receiving the expected uh, results. So it's pretty easy and it has a lot of advantages. A flow is composed basically by an emitter, which will be responsible of uh, the emissions to generate those emissions, and a collector, which will be responsible to get those emissions. And these look pretty similar to what we want to achieve. So we want something that emitters events as something that collects events. Perfect. So we are going to use it. For using it, we need some tools, which are the flow builders to generate emissions, flow operators to modify and transform these emissions, and flow collectors to receive those emissions. As flow builders, we have a lot. I'm here showing only the maybe the most popular ones, but depending on your case, maybe you will have to use a different one, but don't hesitate to take to check the, the documentation, it's pretty good. So you have flow that will create a flow with the given suspendable block. So here you can include a suspendable block that will generate the, the missions. Flow off that defines a flow from a set of, of values. And as flow that is an extension that will convert uh, collections in, in a flow. Then we have the flow operators. If you have used uh, operators uh, from Ares Java or, or even the collections uh, methods, they will be very familiar for you. Uh, we have map that will modify every one of the, of the elements that are em emitted, filter that will return another flow containing only the values that comply with the, with the predicate, take that will only uh, return, will return a flow that will only emit um, the elements uh, of the count that we have given to it. For example, if we say take 10, it will take only, it will emit only the 10 first element. This thing until change that will return a flow uh, wherever, uh, only if there is any change. Then we have also flattening flow operators. So we can convert and other flows in a, a flatten emissions and return it, return them as part of the same flow. And then we have the flow collectors. We have collect that uh, will allow us to collect all the elements. Uh, we have reduce and fold that are pretty similar. Reduce will uh, accumulate the last value and will apply a, a, an operation to the to every new value. And fold is the same with the difference that you have to specify which will be the initial value that is going to use. 
and first that will only collect the first element. So yeah, we have everything ready to, to do our MBI. Let's model this in code. So we are going to have something that will emit the UI events, which will be the user, but he or she needs help to, to convert those emissions in code. We will see how can we do that uh, now. Then those UI events, uh, we are going to map them to axioms or not. I have said whatever fits our needs. Then those axioms or UI events will be mapped uh, into results using the processor. And then we are going to collect these results and do something with them. We are going to reduce them using the last view state and we'll publish them to the view. But we need something more because flows are, are called. So we need to be able to um, uh, emit those events even if there is anybody coll uh, collecting them and we need to uh, be able to publish them uh, every time one of them is, is happening. So this is where a state flow comes in handy. A state flow is a read-only state with a single, a single updatable uh, data value that emits updates to the value to, to its, co its collector. So we have something that uh, we are going to say, um, we are going to give a value and every time the value change is going to emit its value to its collector. A state flow is a hot flow because it's active in, it's, it's an active, uh, so, uh, sorry, it's active instance exists independently of the presence of collector. That means that you can have a state flow emitting values even if there is no collector, which is what we call a, a hot flow. So we are going to create in our view model, presenter, whatever we use in our architecture, uh, we are going to create our mutable state flow with the view state. And then every time that um, in the view, no, we are going to collect these changes. So every time everything change in the, in the state flow, we are going to render a new view this could be done dif in different ways. Uh, always try to change the less possible in the view. So for example, uh, you can then uh, take this view state and divide it in, in, different, um, in different methods. So you can process every element of the view uh, independently. And if it doesn't change, uh, you don't have to change it. So here you have several options. And then we are going to use share flow in the case of, uh, of, the, uh, of the UI event. So we are going to use um, this share flow every time a user does uh, a UI event. For example, in my case, uh, when, the, when the activity or the fragment launches, uh, I'm going to emit the event the, that says start quiz. You can also implement here, for example, uh, when the user clicks uh, that the question is answered, uh, that he has or she has selected an answer, uh, you will emit an UI event. Um, I don't remember, answer question or, or whatever you have programmed for that. Well, now we have our MBI fully composed. We had this before where we needed something that will emit the UI event and something that will reduce them um, and publish it to the view. And now we have our action flow that what was an state flow and our reduced view state method that will listen or observe the, um, the results and will reduce them uh, and publish them using the, the share flow that we are using to send them to the view. Sorry, the state flow. And now it is finished. No, we still need to think about a special case, which is the infamous single events. And it's what happens when you have something in the screen that has to be disappear once uh, something has happened, for example, when, when some time has passed. It is the case of the DOS messages. For example, if you are using a DOS message to, so, 
to show an error. Um, you are going to reflect that in your view state. You're going to say those message must, uh, must be shown. And then you have to find a way to uh, remove that from your view state um, because otherwise the next time something changes in that view state is going to be shown again because it is already, it's already put to true. So you need something to change that value. Uh, and in this case, there are no, there is not a ideal solution, or I haven't found an ideal solution yet. I have seen multiple uh, options which will be used a different flow, which I don't like a lot because I really like to have an unidirectional data flow. But it was people used to to do in those cases. So a different flow would imply to use a channel, for example, to post these single events because the channel is. Uh, will not remember the last uh, event it has. Then another option is to uh, use a same flow, but emit an UI event to remove it. For example, as soon as the toast is shown, I'm going to emit a new UI event as if the, if the user has done something. And it's going to uh, do all the unidirectional data flow or all our IMBI flow. And modify the view state. And another option is send double view state events, one for showing it, one for removing it from the state. So in the moment that you are changing this in the view state, you uh, this view state is sent to the view, and then you send another view state right uh, after that, saying that it, it is going to be removed. So the, the view state will uh, uh, object will be updated. So yes, it, there is no an ideal one. It, de it depends on whatever you or your team decides to do, or uh, all of them has its downside. The easiest one maybe will be to implement a different flow, but then you you are not you are somehow not doing a unidirectional data flow. So yeah, I can, here there is not an ideal ideal solution. And yes, I I still don't know anything about intervals. I cannot remember all of them. At least I learned a bit about uh, how to do this MBI implementations using Flow and it works nicely. So, well, I'm happy for that and I'm happy to share it with, with you. Uh, I have included a lot of not musical references. There is a lot of documentation about this, and those are the ones that I use for this presentation and for crafting my app. And if you have any question, you can reach me in my handle here in Twitter. Um, thank you for, for coming here and for listening to me during this time. Thank you. <laughs>